you can tell when you've invited a White House guy to an event, because he's the one schmoozing the <laughs> audience when you should be getting started. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming. It's, um, it, it, it's a pleasure to see so many people willing to turn out for a boring subject like this in the first week of exams. Um, uh, so, so I'm Eben Moglen, and I teach in the law school, and what I do is to try and figure out how freedom can exist uh, in the 21st century, uh, a problem which seems to me excessively difficult, so excessively difficult that I started trying to figure out what to do about it late in the 20th century, and, and look where we wound up. Um, the, the predicate of what we're doing um, I guess is pretty simple. Um, every day uh, we open the newspaper and we discover that these two things called artificial intelligence and machine learning are going to change society. Fourth industrial revolution I heard this morning. Uh, much more dangerous than all the rest of them put together and so on. Uh, everybody knows that everything is going to be different. Nobody knows exactly how the hype to reality proportion is always quite high because the real problems are extremely difficult and nobody really knows how to begin solving them. Uh, and the unreal problems, the sunshine about how everything is going to be wonderful tomorrow is so uh, extraordinarily well worked out that we spend a lot of time, uh, if, well, imagining, let us say, uh, how everything is going to be. Uh, governments around the world are both extremely conscious of the importance of what is happening and extremely stumped by what to do. Uh, the question, how does public policy get made in this world uh, of new and differently scaled, differently scoped information technology uh, is the most important problem on the long thinkers lists, not those worrying about Brexit immediate running out of drinking water in their cities or something of that kind. Uh, I wanted to have a conversation about that and uh, two of the very most deep thoughted and long experienced people in the world uh, were willing to come and join us uh, to talk about it. Um, so let me introduce them to you, then we'll have a little bit of colloquy here and then given the extraordinarily well informed audience I see before me, we'll try and do it all uh, collectively. Um, to my right, uh, Paul Nemitz, the principal advisor to the Director General for Justice and Consumer Protection of the European Commission, uh, a post in which he has been for uh, approximately a year now after um, destroying the global economy with GDPR, a subject we'll come back <laughs> to uh, before nice uh, soon enough. Uh, in his previous post as Director for Fundamental Rights and Union Citizenship and the Directorate General for Justice of the European Commission, he led negotiations on the Code of Conduct Against Hate Speech on the Net, the ES, EU US Privacy Shield, which we'll come back to in a moment, uh, and the GDPR of uh, sainted memory. Um, <laughs> Uh, he launched a justice policy work stream on democracy, freedom of speech, and press plurality in Europe, uh, beginning with a colloquium on fundamental rights hosted by Franz Timmermans uh, in November of uh, 2016. Paul's a visiting professor of law at the College of Europe in Bruges and uh, a great and important friend of everything we do, GDPR. Not, to the contrary, <laughs> notwithstanding. That's um, not fair. That's okay, not fair. now that, that was really important. Our first intercontinental agreement uh, of the day. Uh, to my left, uh, Daniel J. Weitzner, founding director of the MIT Internet Policy Research Initiative uh, and the principal research scientist at CSAIL uh, on uh, policy questions. He teaches internet public policy in MIT's electrical engineering and computer science department. It is a very important milestone in the 21st century that you can't teach electrical engineering and computer science at MIT without public policy. That's a, that's, that's a life change for the thing called computer science, which was never about any of those things when I was young, which is why I didn't want to take it. Um, uh, from 2011 to 2012, Danny was the United States Deputy Chief Technology Officer for Internet Policy in the White House, uh, a role which allowed him to lose uh, 
many very important policy uh, uh, decisions to the Director of National Intelligence and other uh, American government officials, but, but gracefully and persistently, let us say, uh, uh, it, where he led initiatives on online privacy, cybersecurity, internet copyright, and trade policies to promote free flow of information. He was also Associate Administrator for Policy at the United States Commerce Department's National Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA, when we are not in a post-fact American government, is one of the most important factual research organizations in American government. I'm not sure how much facts still matter, but if they matter, it's too bad that Danny's successors at NTIA don't have quite the leeway he had. He was a member of the Biden of the Obama Biden presidential transition team. It says here in this biography. Um, Enough said about that. Uh, Danny has been a leader in the development of internet public policy from its inception, it says here, which is surely true. Uh, from the beginning of EFF and the beginning of CDT and the beginning of most of the policy shops that have considered these questions in the relation to the United States government since, well, since all of us were young. Um, he, he has uh, made fundamental contributions to the successful fight for strong online free expression protection in the United States Supreme Court, crafting laws that provide protection against government surveillance of email and web browsing data. We did have those once. Um, his work on U.S. legislation limiting the liability of Internet service providers laid the foundations for social media services and supporting the global free flow of information online. Uh, that's, a, that's an ironic distinction there. <laughs> Safe harbor. I'll, we I'll, I'll, invented I'll, I'll own it. I'll still own it. There you go. That's that's why it's so great to have these people with us. Um, it, it, we are now all of us in the age of artificial intelligence, but you can't do anything with artificial intelligence that you can't do with real intelligence first. So I'm hoping that we're going to get some real progress here this afternoon that no machine could have learned for us. Uh, I think the place to begin, uh, Paul, is by saying, so uh, now that personal data privacy is a solved problem, uh, artificial intelligence, big data, and public policy, how will the next European Commission, the one that will come into existence at the end of this decade? How, how will it face those problems? What do you think the issues on which you are advising them to pay their biggest attention will be? Well, uh, internet policy, of course, is a very broad uh, field, and I think it's right to have a holistic view at it at theory, in theory, but in practice, of course, there are very few people who are able to deliver such a holistic view, and uh, I also happen to believe that actually in terms of academic work, <coughs> We need something like a theory of the meta-dialogue between the digital and democracy. So, you know, with this in mind, um, I can't give you a, a complete and exhausting picture of uh, you know, what the next commission, which will take office in September 2019, we have elections in Europe in June 2019, uh, we'll have to look at, but um, artificial intelligence is certainly a subject, and uh, the way our legislative cycles work, that from one year before the elections, so that means from June this year, we don't start any new projects on legislation. Um, that's why everything we do right now on artificial intelligence is, you know, it's soft policy, it's scoping, it's a structures for deliberative process. Um, and it can maybe prepare, you know, depending on the development of program, problem identification, uh, measures of law or policy starting at the end of 2019, uh, beginning of 2020. So what we have done is on 25 of April, you know, we have published a policy statement on artificial intelligence, which is largely inspired, first of all, by our industrial policy people who say, you know, got to catch up with America, got to catch up with China. But in our processes, any initiative which starts, sooner you know, or later comes also to the guys who look from a fundamental rights you would call it civil liberties point of view and democracy point of view. So this communication also has a chapter on law and ethics uh, challenges uh, in the area of artificial intelligence. And this chapter um, addresses, you know, on the one hand, let's say the more profane issues of civil liability, you know, these autonomous systems, can they break the chain of responsibility? But 
it also, um, in a nutshell, spells out the question, don't we need a principle that by design, these programs, which will be pervasive, which will factually set the rules in society everywhere, starting from education via city management right to health, that they need to incorporate by design from the outset the basic elements of the constitutional settlement, rule of law, meaning, you know, they have to comply with all existing law, um, um, fundamental rights, and democracy. And, um, you know, posing this question is already controversial because, you know, in the classic um, approach to technology regulation, you know, the classic neoliberal technology uh, regulation approach is, you know, let them, let them move forward, let's see, let's not stand in the way of innovation. I would say um, we have become a little bit wiser, all of us in the United States and Europe also, maybe that that is not so smart, in particular when you deal with uh, technologies which may have irreversible impacts. So we've learned that uh, uh, the first time, of course, with atomic power, um, but I would say that in every technology where you have invisible risks, and when I mean invisible risks, um, I'm talking about the in invisibility to the electorate, the demos, not to the experts. There is a danger that um, politics and policy and democracy moves too slowly. And of course, this danger um, has to be taken serious when it is possible and cannot with certainty be excluded that in the long term there would be irreversible negative consequences. So that's Hans Jonas, the principle of responsibility in 1979, which led to the principle of precaution in environmental policy, which in Europe now is primary law, not only for environmental policy, but actually for all policy. So it obliges us to anticipate, to look into the future, and we have a principle which is called the principle of essentiality. That means anything which happens in society, which can either have an impact on individual rights of people, or can be very important for the society as a whole is something which needs to be dealt with by the legislator, in particular when it involves exercise of state power. So, you know, with this in mind, um, it is true that we may be a little bit more anticipatory. We uh, still have a network of technology um, impact assessment systems for parliamentary purposes. In the United States, you had this too until it was closed in the time of Reagan, the, the Congressional uh, Office of Technology um, Impact Assessment. I think uh, in the times in which we live, this becomes very important again. And this is basically what we're doing right now. You know, we're trying to identify what exactly are the challenges to individual rights of artificial intelligence, what are the democracy challenges, and honestly, uh, one doesn't need to search very far. There is already a lot of material on the market, including very good material from America here in New York, AI Now, you know, the, the, all this work is excellent work. There are around 15 ethics catalogs and ethics codes for artificial intelligence already there. They have identified all the problems. So the question is, how then are the solutions going to look? And there the thorny debate is, as I perceive it, can we all now leave this to ethics, the new word of fashion when we talk about artificial intelligence, or don't we need the classic type of legal regulation? The difference being that law has the legitimacy of democracy, ethics codes don't, because these are self-appointed groups of people, you know, it's the church or whoever, you know, but, hmm. and uh, second, Ethics codes are not enforceable while the law is. And maybe, you know, in the world in which we live, which has very big companies with a lot of power and they may be talking very smooth and very smart and very sweet, but to get them to do something is a completely different ball game. So from time to time, I would say, you know, it's quite good to have enforceable law. So I think the challenge before us now, and I will stop there for the next commission, is to identify which of the challenges which AI poses to public interest, public policy, democracy, fundamental rights, rule of law, can safely be left to ethics and self-regulation, and which, on the other hand, requires binding law. And I will give you um, 
one example, and there are not so many yet, and I'm interested in the discussion here whether you have other ideas, where I'm already quite convinced that we need binding law. And that is the making visible in the context of public debate in the automated public sphere, and I would say, you know, the more urgent, the closer we get to elections, that um, a machine is talking to you and not a human. So, you know, when you wake up in the morning and you think, gee, you know, everybody is in favor of this or that candidate today on the, on the social media, you need to know that all these messages come from machines or are these real humans? Because democracy otherwise is not going to work anymore. So in the same way that we oblige those who call themselves journalists, force power, very important, um, to make it visible when they receive money for the contributions, uh, you know, then it has to be marked, at least in Europe, in the newspaper and also in TV, it has to be marked, you know, sponsored content. Um, in the same way, I would say we have to mark machine participation in public discourse, whether in spoken language or written language. And this must be a rule which is enforced, and I would say pretty tightly. Because, you know, otherwise democratic processes, elections and so on, and I'm now not getting into fake news and propaganda and all these things, just this thing alone can destroy democracy. So we have to take these things serious. And I would say that the time of naive John Perry Barlow, you know, stay out of this Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace, 1996. These times are definitely over. Unfortunately, there are too many people who only learn by catastrophe. We have had a number of catastrophes, so let's collectively learn from this and do what is necessary to make sure that AI will deliver the benefits and we will not suffer from the negatives. Just one question. Uh, occurs to me before we ask Danny to weigh in that your identification of industrial policy as the conversational interlocutor for this position uh, should, I think, be made even more pointed. There are a lot of businesses in the 21st century that consist of pretending to be human. Uh, that's a very important business model. Um, the, the dating services need non-human potential dates to keep the flow running and uh, the advertisers need thought leadership and influencers whether real or not real the 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 the, the legislation you're imagining the sort of no cheating on turing tests bill uh, confronts a really serious economic pressure in the other direction um, having the machine interact with human beings on the basis of pretending to be human is a trillion dollar source of wealth in future. Isn't the industrial policy of this going to turn out to be in Europe? We need a Google and a Facebook and a Twitter of our own. Where's our Baidu? Where's our Tencent? I, I don't know. I mean, yes, you know, that's what we say. We would love to have it. But our policy is extremely open. The American companies and also Chinese companies, they can earn, and they do earn, billion of dollars uh, in Europe, and the in internal market of 500 million people benefits them first. Uh, you know, I mean, just to give you an example, uh, Microsoft alone earns 20 billion uh, uh, European uh, euros, which is you know, 22 or 24 billion uh, US dollars, only from licensing fees from public authorities in Europe. So, you know, big money is made by European com uh, American companies in Europe. They, this whole <sighs> propaganda about protectionism and so on, I, I think, honestly, it's, it's, it's crap. And I would say, you know, if you believe in the primacy of democracy, you have to face the fight of being willing to say, we don't want a world which is ruled in the first by technology or for that matter, corporate and economic interest. We want a world which is ruled by democracy and of course one has to fight for it. These things, these regulations, uh, you know, to get them through and, uh, you know, my exercise of six years of being bombarded by the lobby from the morning until the afternoon, you know, and the evening and in the night, you know, and not only American lobby, but also of course economic interests from within Europe and elsewhere in the world, you know, you just have to stand through them. 
And, uh, you know, I think that's the job of elected uh, politicians and also of a civil service where, at least in our system, we are lifetime civil servants. So, you know, we can afford uh, uh, to not make friends with everyone. All right. So, uh, now is the moment for the American view, I think. If you don't mind being the American <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know what an American view is exactly <laughs> anymore. I'll give you Danny's view. Um, I, I, you know, I... I think that I'll make kind of one general statement, but I, I actually want to then start with a sort of a story. I, I do think that, you know, the, the web is on order of 25 years old. The internet as a commercial entity that is an entity that anyone in the public could use is a little bit older than that. Um, and, and I think that, I think there's a lot, what I hope to suggest is that I think there's a lot to learn, both positive and negative, about what the experience both in the U.S. and around the world has been of, in the way that we've approached uh, uh, policy, law, regulation, and social practice uh, on the web in this roughly quarter century. I think there's some good parts of the story. I think there's some not so good parts of the story. Um, uh, there's always the risk of kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, as it were, and I'm, I'm pretty committed to making sure doing whatever I can do to make sure we don't do that because some of what I think we have gotten right is, um, you know, a really enormous change in the way people access information, notwithstanding the fact that there's some of it that's crap, as Paul would say. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but, but I think around the world, people's relationship to information is fundamentally changed. People's ability to speak has fundamentally changed. Uh, um, uh, in a way that I think uh, supports a lot of important values. And I would actually say that people's relationship to democracy and ability to participate in the democratic process has also fundamentally changed. And I would still say for the net good, um, uh, we're very focused on the effects of 2016 uh, where there were clearly, you know, real problems uh, um, which I think are in part associated with, with choices that we've made about how we regulate the internet environment um, and, and the ability to exploit it by, by clever uh, adversaries like um, uh, Mr. Putin. Um, but I'd also say we shouldn't forget 2008 when, uh, you know, my experience working uh, for the upstart candidate, um, uh, then Senator Obama, was that he was not supposed to be the Democratic Party candidate. Hillary Clinton was supposed to be the Democratic Party candidate. It was obvious she was the inevitable candidate. And a bunch of things happened very much dependent upon the way the internet works uh, um, that, that made it possible for him to, to change the story. And, and so we shouldn't forget that kind of effect uh, when we're thinking about the clearly very damaging effects that we've had to democracy um, uh, to date. But I, I do think a lot of what we've gone through in the last uh, 25 years has been kind of just a warm up for, for the, the choices that we face uh, going forward. And the reason for that, I'll, I'll try to explain with a, a story. Um, uh, when I first arrived at MIT, it was after about 10 years uh, working in Washington on a lot of these issues in the 90s very much from a kind of a, in a kind of a law and policy culture. And I arrived at MIT to work with uh, Tim Berners-Lee, who was running this new thing called the World Wide Web Consortium, which uh, did a lot of the, the basic design of the web as it evolved and set the technical standards for the web. Um, and Tim, in part of, he did this kind of personal orientation for everyone who came to work for him. And he said, uh, um, rule number one is, if it's not on the web, it doesn't exist. That was his maxim. And he actually meant something, on the one hand, very small by that, which was basically share your work. So, uh, you know, if you're writing something and you're doing it with a bunch of people, don't, set, don't spend three months just writing off on your little private, uh, you know, hard drive as we had then. Uh, uh, put it on the web, that is at least on the web that was accessible to all of us in the web consortium and share it and make it available. And so it was a sort of a simple, uh, uh, you know, share with people. Uh, um, uh, view, but it actually reflected. I came to understand a much uh, bigger view of the world and a much bigger view of what the web was going to be. Tim designed the web from the beginning so that essentially every piece of information 
uh, in the world could be represented on the web in a common information space. And that was the extraordinary and revolutionary thing that, 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 that he did with the web. The internet had the basis for doing that because of the way its addressing system worked. But the web kind of realized that by having a unified set of, of URLs, the addresses that, that, that we all know, so that everything everything in the world could be represented on the web. And that seemed like a kind of a silly idea in the mid-90s, because all we really had on the web was sort of random documents and the occasional song in some kind of MP3 file or something like that. But now we really do have, to a first approximation, pretty much everything on the web uh, uh, in one way or, or, or the other. And um, it's because of that that, uh, now that doesn't mean it's all accurate or it's all true, but it's somehow all there. Um, and what really enables uh, uh, a lot of the artificial intelligence technology that we're talking about is the fact that everything is there and we want to learn from it. We want to do things with that information. What's tricky about that is that what's on the web is what happened in the past and maybe what's going on in the present, but we want to predict the future with it. Um, and, you know, my colleagues in computer science some maybe act as if this is all brand new stuff and the machine learning is this kind of extraordinary power that has descended from heaven. Um, it really isn't, as, 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 as many of you know. It is really uh, simply the reinvention of statistics. Uh, it's the reinvention uh, um, of the ability uh, to make predictions, hopefully reliable predictions, um, uh, from the past about the future, um, uh, or from one sample of data to, to broader generalizations. And I think a lot of the questions that we're going to have about the way to, quote, regulate artificial intelligence, which I think is a bit of a misnomer, and I'll say why, but a lot of the questions that we legitimately have about regulating the uses of artificial intelligence have to do with the fact that we're going to have to remember all over again all the things that we actually know about the use of statistics in public life. So as an example, uh, um, no one gets to just make random statements about the population of the United States or, uh, 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 or, or, or any other country in the world or the population of New York City. Right. Uh, we actually have ways of counting. And even if we can't count everyone, we have ways of taking samples of populations and inferring in a reliable way from those samples to uh, uh, what we think is true in the world. And we don't let anyone do that. We, we, we expect that you're a statistician. We expect that you're an economist, that you're a demographer. You have some training. You use some method that is recognizable. And what is a little hard about machine learning right now is that a lot of those methods don't actually exist. If you ask people, well, how do you tell whether, whether a machine, learn, uh, machine vi vision algorithm is producing the right results, uh, an accurate result? How do you measure the accuracy? It's still very hard to do. It's not, they're not really understood ways, uh, uh, standardized ways uh, of doing that. If you ask um, uh, how likely is it that an autonomous vehicle is going to hit uh, uh, you know, a divider in the road or hit a pedestrian, as occasionally now seems to happen, um, uh, the answer is, well, hopefully not very often, but how can you, can you look at that system and actually make a prediction uh, about when it's going to happen next? You really can't. Um, so um, we have the challenge of, as I said, reinventing a sense of, of, of accuracy, reliability, and truth in these new systems that we're building. What I think is going to be especially challenging is that the tools to do this, um, uh, certainly the software tools, and to a lesser extent, the data on which those software tools run, um, are to a first approximation available to anyone. Uh, anyone could use them. You can go download uh, Google's TensorFlow. You can run it on uh, the, a cloud version of that service. A bunch of other companies are coming along and doing that. So people have the ability to be the equivalent of um, uh, the U.S. Census uh, uh, chief economist and have no clue what they're doing. Uh, and, and that, I think, is going to pose uh, a very serious set of challenges. And as opposed to just a couple of economists or a couple of companies like a Google or a Facebook or whatever who we might uh, sort of figure out how to subject to some set of standards, we're really going to have a lot of people. Uh, who are going to have these capabilities, who are going to integrate them all over the place. And, and I would say, for, for all that I uh, absolutely agree with Paul, 
that we, we ought to be setting standards through a democratic process. We ought to be setting expectations in, in, a, in a way that's visible and, and uh, accountable to society. Uh, we don't yet know the terms on which we should be doing that. So it's much easier to say we should have those standards and much harder to say what they ought to be. Uh, um, and, and, I'll, and I'll just, I want to just say a couple things very quickly about what I think we've learned from the experience of pretty rapidly having to integrate a lot of the new capabilities that the internet offered. I think they're different in, in, in many ways, but they do represent a, you know, a, a new technology that all of a sudden came into a lot of people's hands very quickly, shifted power relationships quite dramatically. And there are a couple things that I actually think we got right. Um, I think, number one, we did, um, in the US and Europe and, and other parts of the world, um, identify some clear principles that we thought were important uh, uh, in the way these, the internet technology was going to be used. In the case of the internet, I think in the US we were a little bit better at articulating uh, the importance of free expression, maybe not quite as good at articulating the importance of privacy. Um, uh, Europe maybe got that a little bit uh, um, in the opposite direction. Um, uh, though I would say that together, uh, the US and Europe actually put together a pretty, a pretty reasonably effective package of, of, of those principles. We also did something that I think was extraordinarily important. We established some bright line rules. Um, uh, uh, bright line rules that the new internet platforms, the new internet companies could apply pretty clearly. Um, so uh, uh, Evan mentioned the um, uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, the liability limitation on platform providers that said that speech that, that uh, third party speech essentially that, that's available on platforms uh, uh, is not the responsibility of the platform provider but instead the responsibility of the speaker. Um, uh, we're now discovering some of the limitations of that rule but nevertheless that rule did enable platforms to grow uh, very quickly to make their services available very widely, I think engendering quite a bit of social benefit. And they could do it because the rule was really clear. It wasn't actually subject to very much interpretation. And rule interpretation is expensive, number one, and hard to do for, for uh, new technology developers. The, the other thing I want to say about what I think we got right is that we were very clear, at least in the US, that existing law still applies. That just because something's happening on the internet doesn't make it dramatically different. So there's a bit of a caricature between the US and Europe about um, Europe having a lot of laws and US having no laws. It's a silly caricature. Uh, um, uh, US, the, the, the US has, ha has some of the oldest privacy laws such as the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And pretty early on, it was made very clear that, for example, if you were performing a service that looked like a credit reporting service, that, if you, that is, if you were a company like Spokio that, 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 that tried to rate uh, potential employees, if you were a company like uh, Instant Check that, that, that provided reliability ratings for uh, roommates and tenants, that even though that was happening on the internet, even though that used untraditional sources of data, Federal Trade Commission said very clearly, you're a credit reporting agency and you have all the responsibilities that we put on those agencies in 1970. So we did, we did remain clear or eventually got clear that just because something is happening in a new technology context, the, 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 the rights and obligations that we put on uh, individuals, on consumers and on companies that, that, that serve them in commerce uh, um, still apply. Um, the final thing I'm going to say is that I think that the other thing that, the other tool that I think has been very important in the development of the internet in particular, in a lot of ways of software and the kind of digitally driven services in general, is that we did evolve a whole number of social conventions that shaped the way information flowed, that shaped the way things like software were available to people. These were, and, and, and I'm thinking specifically of, of the work that, that, that Eben and people in the free software movement have done for decades now, that um, not through any kind of government fiat, and often despite government fiats, um, uh, said that organized people to have a particular relationship to software. 
to say that people should be able to uh, see software, they should be able to interact with it, they should, they should be able to change it, they should be able to understand how it works. Uh, similarly, uh, Creative Commons licensing, which was a, a kind of a way of providing open access to documents and, and other kinds of data. It was a set of social conventions that governed how hundreds of thousands, millions of people, hundreds of millions of people arguably, relate to the information in this new digitally driven environment. And, and I think we ought to make sure to give adequate credit to those efforts, which are regulatory efforts, which are efforts that shape the way we all live in this world. They didn't come from government. They rely on certain government institutions to enforce. But I think that we're going to need to use those kind of tools every bit as much as we use uh, um, uh, uh, tools that are derived uh, uh, directly from government action, simply because we have such a complex environment uh, uh, to, to figure out, to figure our relationship to, sometimes it's going to be better to do it that way than through a more traditional regulatory process. All right, so let's get a little closer to a couple of the technologies hidden inside those words, AI and big data, along the lines that you were offering. What, what, we, what we have that we call machine learning is pattern matching on steroids. Um, and what it is allowing us to do is to learn things about people that they don't know about themselves. Because we possess so much behavioral data being collected by so many highly motivated commercial parties. And that behavioral data can be used to generate inferences both about individuals and about populations that are obscure. They constitute a reservoir of hidden power and the question of how democracy is supposed to interact with that, which both Paul and you have addressed in the different conceptual frameworks of your governmental systems are well, not just an ethical or a legal problem. They're fundamental to a replacement of social sciences by something new, what our friend Sandy Pentland called social physics, right? That you have all those you have all those data about all those molecules bouncing around in the bottle, and now you can say something about those things that those molecules themselves could not possibly reach on their own. It's not only statistics, it's the basis of the statistics. It's the thing we call data science. When I went to give a talk in the new Columbia Data Sciences Institute, what was that, five years ago, called How Not to Be Evil While Data Mining? Nobody was really <laughs> interested, I can assure you. It was not important. Let's, let's worry about the environmental consequences of the mining after we learn how to get the coal. Um, but now we have it, <laughs> quite a lot of it. Um, and it has unintended consequences that we don't necessarily expect. People upload their genetic data to a genealogy website in order to find their long lost third cousins and the next thing you know, uh, law enforcement is using that to find serial killers on the run for decades. We're all very happy that we're catching serial killers on the run for decades and we're all a little bit creeped out by the fact that all that genetic material uploaded by consumers for family discovery purposes is about to have enormous and far-reaching social consequences. What, 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 what you in conversation before we started called horizontal effect everywhere, uniformly transformative but not necessarily evident. The same thing applies to what we are calling AI these days. I, I, I have been wondering about this artificial intelligence since the first time Marvin Minsky explained to me that it was going to happen and it was going to be perfect and all of that. Um, I, what we mean is autonomous systems. And, and, and I do have a pretty strong intuition that there will be two kinds of autonomous systems in the 21st century. There will be Chinese ones which will not explain to anybody what they are doing because that's Western democracy and we're against it. And there will be whatever we invent. And from my point of view, this again is an industrial policy issue in a way. Whatever it is that Mr. Manukin and Mr. Lighthizer are supposed to be agreeing about, presenting a common front in Beijing, that must be extremely difficult, I would think. But, but whatever is the common front that they uh, are going to be presenting in Beijing, what they're really doing is standing astride made in China 2025 and trying to yell stop. They're trying to present an alternate industrial policy in which Chinese autonomous systems are not more powerful and more effective than the autonomous systems of the democratic world. 
That seems to me, in a way, a second best objective. The better objective would be the one that we recommend when Paul's colleagues get down on Google and Facebook and why don't you invent your own? The real question is how are we going to have autonomous systems that know how to, how to explain themselves and have an obligation to do that? From my point of view, I, I, I feel the rightness of what you say. In the 20th century, comrades of mine worried a lot about how to make it possible for people to understand computer programs. And the basic answer was hack copyright to make sure everybody gets the source code. And, and that worked to a, to a very good extent, right? I mean, if what we're talking about is stuff that runs on Unix boxes, that was the correct answer. But it wasn't a full answer even then, and it can't be a full answer in a world where code is simple and training data is the whole subject. Now we need data licensing, you're quite right, without the Creative Commons element of our thinking in the 20th century, we could make no progress here. But beyond the problem of the, 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 the access to data which actually determines the inferences that engines produce, we also have the problem of building forms of autonomy which are communicative, which are explanatory, which take responsibility for expressing what they are. Paul's test, no cheating on Turing tests on this continent, please, seems to me really important, but it's kind of a low bar. If all we are doing is making autonomous systems identify themselves, I'm an autonomous system, I'm not going to tell you what I'm doing. <laughs> the disclaimer is of limited value. What we really require is a rule that says, I did once upon a time argue for the retrofitting of the first law of robotics into our technology. Now I realize that that's not good enough anymore. What we actually needed was a fourth law which says robots will explain to human beings what they are doing or else they can't do it. When Ginny Rometty said on behalf of IBM that there is no acceptable AI that can't explain itself, it seems to me that she was expressing a worthy goal that did not have a whole lot to do with any product IBM currently is selling or knows how to make, but which we all have to find out how to make, or made in China 2025 is what we should be thinking about. The social credit system, the overwhelming use of all the behavioral data in society to constrain who may buy a train ticket who can get a residence permit to live in an attractive place, who can go to which school. If we are saving all the learning behavior of everybody from birth onward, then we are producing alphas, betas, gammas in society without bothering to put any alcohol in the bottles. Systems of teaching have to explain to learners what they are teaching them and why. Systems of transport have to explain where they are taking you and why they're taking you there. We, we, we are actually asking for forms of technological transparency, which some of us in the 20th century had very primitive ideas about within very limited technological contexts. But within the two forms of technological development now rapidly going on, learning more about society than society knows through better patterns, and the creation of autonomous agents that operate in meat space and run over people and cause harm, but even more importantly, lurk behind all the systems we are familiar with, biasing outcomes in ways which nobody gets to hear an explanation about, we are up against the radical difficulties of technological obscurity. I don't think that the choice is between regulation and ethics. I, I, that seems to me, as it seems to both of you, inadequate. We are talking about law. But what law? What is the proper role of the state in these subjects? So once again, let me try and be specific technologically. More than a decade ago, a former student of mine who was then a minister of social welfare in a Western European democracy called me in to, to the ministry for an official consultation. His question was very simple. He said, okay, so now I'm running this large social welfare bureaucracy in this state of millions of people. And I've learned that this big bureaucracy barely responds to me at all. But maybe as minister, I can do one thing. 
So here's the thing I want to do, Evan. Tell me, how do I use big data to make the lives of workers better in my country? OK, I said, that's a really good question. We could assemble a team of experts around the world who could help you to answer that. How does big data make workers' lives better? Thing is, if I come back here in a year and you're the Minister of Defense, it'll all have gone for naught. Well, that's basically what happened. He got promoted. He worked his way up a coalition government. He became deputy prime minister. And then his Social Democratic Party got 6.5% of the vote in the last general election in his country, wiped out like so many other traditional Social Democratic parties around Europe. Why? Well, one could say because he hadn't figured out how to deliver better lives for workers in his country using big data. We do have more than just protecting privacy or regulating misbehavior to be responsible for. We need to explain how public policy made around these forms of new information technology can actually make people's lives better. And we need to explain that directly. Nanda Nilakeni, who had so much to do with building the Aadhaar system in India, said last month that Indians should be willing to give up all their personal data in order to get better health care and cheaper loans. My view was that that was a really low ball offer. But it constituted what a British politician would call at least a retail offer to the voters in his great big democracy. This is what we're going to deliver for you in return for your participation in a biometric database embracing everybody that is going to rule the world. Well, at least he explained what it was, cheaper loans and better health care. My view is if we're really going to talk about the role of public policy in connection with these things, we're going to have to start explaining the voters pretty soon why this is good for them directly and immediately. Otherwise, all this obscure technology becomes more of the rigged system I don't understand that seems to be working for somebody else, which is empowering not my favorite politicians all around the democratic world. So that, 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 that would be the, the thing that seems to me most important, that we get, we, we need law. We need to understand how to govern new social science and new forms of autonomy in society, technological autonomy, directly. We need to do that in a fashion which allows us actually to explain to voters in democracies why all this makes their lives better. It seems to me the positive case is crucial, not just in order to protect the policymakers from populist pushback, but because this is either the real promise of this technology or it is just more inequality. Those who possess the strongest inference engines yeah, will but, rule. But, but, but even the job of the policymaker is not to make the lives of worker better by using big data. The sentence stops before. The job is to make the lives better. And, you know, whether big data delivers it or other tools, that is, you know, a, a, a totally uh, a different question. And in many cases, it will not be big data right now delivering anything. You know, if you look at the productivity increases in America with digitalization, they have gone down. You know, there are companies which make huge profits. But, you know, at the same time, the impact on society are not only positive. So, I, I mean, honestly, I think the challenge for the policymakers, at least in Europe, is much more humble. Uh, our job, first of all, if you look from the fundamental rights point of view, is rather defensive. You know, we have to make sure no harm is done. And we, we are willing to look at the potentials in the positives, but these have to be demonstrated by those who want to sell these technologies. Yeah? I mean, you know, that's, we do a little bit support, you know, a little bit public subsidy. What in America comes out of the Defense Department, we do it as research aid, okay. But, you know, it's not our job as policymakers to prove that these technologies are, you know, the great uh, fulfiller of all dreams. They're probably not. So I think in our discussions, uh, you know, I, I, I think we need a little bit of slowness of thinking. You are brilliant in bringing this all together. I, I can't keep up with this. So <laughs> I, um, I think we, we do need a little bit slowness of thinking and take the issues uh, point by point. So you mentioned the very important issue of the sociological reality in our society. And I think there is truth in that, you know. The only ones who know today the sociological reality in our societies are the Googles and Facebook of this world. They have all the raw data about our lives, our ambitions, our situations. Who has access to this data? 
not the sociologists, not the political scientists, not the historians, it's the corporations which have this data. And that's a problem. And, you know, I think there, the issue of opening up data, not only government data, you know, reuse of government data, yes, let's open up, but there is also the challenge of let's open up data which is held by private companies. And then, of course, we have to make a difference between private personal data uh, uh, on the one hand and non-personal data. But that is certainly a challenge where we in Europe at least also are moving in, in terms of, of, uh, of legislation. And in artificial intelligence this becomes even more pertinent because if you need these data pots to make artificial intelligence work, all the issues of, you know, who has the data pot, how can you use it, how is it constituted, um, it, you know, are there competition issues in monopolizing the data pot, for example, on languages, you know, through the scanning of all books of this world, supposedly Google has this great uh, advantage, you know, this, this needs to be addressed. So I think that's a big chapter. We need to open up the data while at the same time maintaining data protection and privacy. One challenge. Then another challenge, as you say, and you ask the question, how can we make sure that AI explains yourself? Well, I can tell you how we make sure. But being already today clear that these programs will not be able to be used in government, in the judiciary, everywhere where public authority is exercised, if they are not able to motivate their decisions to a degree which on the one hand creates the trust in a democracy necessary by voters and on the other hand allows judicial review. A judge can only review an act of government power if there's a motivation. You know, that's what our law says and if the principle applies that the, 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 the digital doesn't uh, end uh, the application of the normal laws, well, it's a normal law in a, in a rule of law a democratic state that power um, decisions of the government have to be explained. That's how we do it. And if there are programs which don't do it, they cannot be used. So th that means there's a lot of business lost. You know, if you are Microsoft, and I, I understand IBM, they want to sell to government. They make a huge money from government and they know what the requirements are. And there we have to stand firm. If technologists today come and say, guys, you don't understand, you know, this we can never explain the neural system and we will never be able to do it, but you have to accept that the benefit of running this system without explanation is so high that you just have to live with it, the answer must be no. Because that is the end of judicial control of power. That's the end of the basic constitutional settlements un under, under which we live. It just cannot be. And as far as personal data is concerned, and then I stop because I think also, you know, we need a little bit of slowness of thinking because otherwise everything becomes a feuilletonistic mix um, which actually doesn't bring us to any conclusions. But on the question of how does this work with personal data, well, in our regulation, Article 15 and 22, you can read it in the GDPR, you already have the right to object to automated decision making, say I want to have human intervention, and you have the right to ask for meaningful information about the logic of processing, the purposes and the consequences. So, you know, it may not be 100% perfect, but there is already a nucleus, and I'm pretty sure the judges will give this a rather broad interpretation because this is so important. And by the way, for the serious law students among you, there is already also good uh, literature, including in the United States, on this right to explanation under GDPR. Andrew Selbst here from uh, uh, Data and Society um, did an article about this, Sandra Wachter from Cambridge. So this is already something where academics now write and interpret the GDPR, and eventually judges will give us the jurisprudence, how far this right to explanation goes, but as far as personal data is concerned, I think, uh, you know, we're already very close to the goalpost when it comes to motivation and reasoning um, and the right to ask for, for transparency. And, uh, you know, I think we should uh, uh, um, advocate for a broad interpretation of this right, because, you know, if it's narrowly construed, it will not fulfill its purpose. So do you think, Paul, well, that that means that any government purchased autonomous vehicle, car, train, tram, will have to be able to explain its principles of operation in when order to exercising public power? Of course, when the government provides services 
Mm. I'm, 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 what I mean by exercising public power is if it's in, in a um, if it's in a horizontal, uh, not in a horizontal relationship uh, with the individual, but it's vertical. So the state tells you, it makes a decision which says you have to do this and this, or you don't get the building permit, or you know you have to go to prison and so on. So when the state exercises public power, there must be a motivation. When the state is a service provider, thus. Uh, operates like a private party, you know, is not exercising public power, then we are in a different area because then we are in an area which on the face of it, first of all, is not that relevant from the point of view of intrusion into fundamental rights. It can be relevant, but it's not necessarily so. So there we will then have to um, analyze, you know, what are the fundamental rights implications of this private to private relationship um, um, and, and what are the requirements there and they need to be then laid down in law. So, oh, can I just suggest that I, I, I'm all for explanation. I think it's I think it's necessary. I don't think it's sufficient. And I think it's I think there's actually a lesson from everything that we've learned in the U.S. and Europe and around the world about privacy. That in privacy we have fetishized consent. We've fetishized notice and consent. We've said everyone should have a right to have an explanation of privacy practices. And what we know is that no one does anything with them. Uh, and we know that it has not fundamentally made a difference, unfortunately, <laughs> in, in, in the, the realization of what I think is really at the heart of privacy, which to me has much more to do with uh, um, uh, controlling the relationship, the power relationship between individuals and institutions uh, uh, and, and, and the risk of chilling effect on individuals. So we got in privacy because the thing that was sort of easier to talk about was consent and notice. We've spent a lot of time on that. I think there's a bit of a risk that we do the same thing with explanation. Now, let me just say as a caveat, I think the technical questions about how to generate explanations out of neural nets are really interesting. They're important. We're working on them. A lot of people are working on them. We need that. It's necessary. But what I think is the only thing that makes it sufficient is we have to figure out an accountability model. I, I care less about explanation and a lot more about accountability. What I care about with a car, with an autonomous vehicle, is I care about who's responsible when it crashes. I care about who's going to bear the loss. I have a fair amount of confidence that if we can work that out, the, these, these issues of explanation and transparency and everything else will, will, will follow. And, and I'm not saying they're easy, but I think if we, right now we have a lot of work on explanation and very little on accountability. And I actually think we have the same problem in privacy, by the way. Um, but uh, I think that, to me, it's, it's really an essential role for government to uh, essentially, in order to manage the externalities uh, associated with all of these autonomous systems. We've talked, I think, quite correctly about analogies to um, environmental policy. Ultimately, what is environmental policy but managing the externalities of individual and, and institutional behavior that causes harm to others. Um, how we re-internalize that harm is kind of the whole ball game in environmental policy, or 90% of the ball game. Um, and what I think we don't know, how, what I think we have to figure out in a lot of individual cases, whether it's in how do we, uh, we, we may say, I want to come back to your question, Evan, what, what's going to benefit individuals, what's going to benefit society, in the use of advanced analytic technology. Well, I think there's a reasonable, there's reason to believe that um, if we made available um, more widely uh, uh, data about people's health status, both phenotype and genotype and environmental data, we could actually learn a lot about treating a lot of diseases. That would be a good thing, but it has some cost. Uh, you keep all that data around, it can be misused, uh, you know, all kinds of things happen. What government has to do is, is figure out how to make sure that we have internalized the cost of whatever the risk is associated with that kind of potential benefit. And it's really something that only government can do, or maybe government with insurance markets. But um, if, if we actually want to be able to live in you know, a, a kind of a rule of law version of this very data-driven environment as opposed to a Chinese version, which is, you know, the very efficient version of the data-driven environment, but not a necessarily a humane one or one that recognizes individual rights. I think what we have to do at every step is say, 
where are their potential harms and who's responsible for them? Uh, and, and again, I think, if, and, I, and, and I think that is, as Paul, as I think you suggested, I think it's a step-by-step -step process. I think there's one set of uh, questions that you have to answer when it comes to health data. I think there's another set of questions for autonomous vehicles. There's a whole other set of questions for uh, other kinds of transport data. You know, it goes on and on and on because there are different harms. The, the underlying technology is going to look pretty similar, and I'm hoping actually even the underlying explanation capabilities are somewhat generalizable, but what we actually want from them is accountability and managing externalities. Yeah, but let's, but let's follow your point about we want to know who is responsible when cars collide with things. So we did that in the 20th century for a long time by trying to assess fault. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we took explanations. We subjected them to judicial testing and we came to conclusions about who was at fault and therefore who ought to pay. And we discovered after a while that we would do much better if we got rid of the idea of fault and we socialized the processes of paying for all the harm done. It, it, it turned out that the effort to discover who was responsible was at cross purposes with the goal of making sure that... Oh, so I would suggest what we did, because what we did that through insurance mostly, right? And so what we did was we had enough of... Uh, we had enough of an organized set of information about what seemed like a fair way to allocate costs programmatically. That is, if you're under 25, you pay an awful lot more. If you're a male, you pay more. You know, uh, uh, and, and depending where you live, if your car's parked on the street, you pay more. You know, all kinds of things. There was, so yes, I, I agree that we socialized it, but we socialized it based on a whole lot of actuarial data. And, and, and yes, we switched from these sort of individual adjudications of fault to kind of collective adjudications essentially. Yeah, but which a, is it not a big system in America also that there is still a fault determination and if you are at fault then your insurance rate goes up? Yeah, but most, if you're not most, I don't know the numbers, but I think most of the accidents are handled as, as Evan suggested in this no fault okay. environment. But, but the fault is sort of hidden behind the insurance rates though, because everyone does not pay the same. But is there anything fundamental which changes since, you know, Calabresi's cost of accident, who figured all this No, out? no, no, not I mean, even you know, since Oliver we, Wendell Holmes yeah. Jr. thought up the cost of accidents yeah. at the end of the 19th but, but, century. But, you know, I mean, this question of the, of the civil liability is, it's, you know, of course we, are, you know, we, we talk about product liability rules, do they apply, you know, joint and several liability of everybody in the chain, the guy who produces the program, the guy who <laughs> supplies the, 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 the data yeah. part, and so on. I mean, honestly, you know, we are now a big working group, you know, do we need new rules or not? I'm not convinced. I mean, you know, the judges will have to adjudicate according to the rules as they exist. Yes, the autonomy of the system poses questions, but until further notice, I would say, you know, it's, it's very clear, if you produce a technology knowingly which has this autonomy, it will not interrupt your responsibility. So, uh, you know, is this such an, um, an issue which is so difficult and, uh, you know, I think it's, it's going to be... Well, the diff I think the difficulty is you want to make sure that you put the cost of harm on those who can Carry it remediate. On, no, on those who can reduce it, yeah. right? I mean, you... you uh, so, even in the automotive industry structure, um, you know, you've got lots of parties, you've got the automakers who are basically marketing companies that, you know, design cars, but then lots of other people who build them and software developers way underneath there who no one knows who they are or how to, how to control them. Um, uh, so I, I, I guess my thought, Evan, is that um, hopefully, I mean, if all of the law and economics theorists are perfectly correct, that what has happened over time in traditional automotive liability is we've kind of gotten the costs allocated more or less effectively, efficiently, but I don't think we yet quite know how to do that. And I, and I don't know that it's just, I don't know that it's purely a question of individual adjudication. Maybe it starts there, maybe it doesn't, I don't know. Well, my point was I think that in fact we're not certain that the rules of aggregation are going to be the same. 
You were talking about a world of very low quality data. Drivers below 25 are more likely yeah. to bang into things than drivers above 25. Part of the question that we face is how individuated to get in those judgments. After all, the Chinese social credit system wants to know not just are you careless, do you get drunk, but do you have friends who are careless or get drunk? What does your social media show about whether you're likely to pay back your loans? Our ability to, to reduce the, the level of aggregation and to achieve levels of precision in the allocation of yes. fault and responsibility may actually become hypertrophic. The risk is we'll probably do it too well. There I mean, you the, go. Right, right. I mean, and it's, it's sort of like the health care debate that we had in the U.S. where people kind of forgot what insurance was about. Um, and said, well, why should I have to pay for any, any health care ever because I don't get sick? Um, so you could imagine, and we already have these, um, you know, various insurance companies are already selling policies that um, allow you to have the potential of getting uh, uh, rebates on the cost of your insurance if your driving patterns uh, match certain but in profiles. But the automated car world, in the automated car world, I thought that's, you know, that's coming up with artificial intelligence. All this is completely irrelevant. Because well, first you are of all, not, because you're not the driver. The so actual, well, but, but, but I human, think, first of all. The human do, does doing a mistake is not an issue because you sit in your car and you read a book. And so, you know, actually the circle of those who have, you have to look at, it becomes smaller. The day the manufacturers are prepared to agree that you can read a book in your autonomous car, they will be responsible for everything. We can all agree with that. Right. But, the, but the gentleman in Britain who lost his ability to drive for 18 months because he was sitting in the passenger seat of his Tesla with his hands behind his head <coughs> rolling, down the, rolling down the street at 80 yeah. kilometers an hour, Tesla will always say, but it is only, autopilot is only there to assist an alert driver. If we saw that median crash case go into litigation, Tesla would say, but three times in the prior hour, he took his hands off the wheel. And suddenly we would be in an argument about the, pro the, the proportional degree of responsibility between the software that misread the median and the driver who took his hands off the wheel. He should and and I better. think today we already have enormous problems about um, fair rules about who gets access to data, even from cars today. Today's cars mostly have uh, um, uh, vehicle event recorders, little black boxes, kind of like what airplanes have. Um, uh, and there is a lot of contention about who can see that data, how much of it can be seen. Um, uh, the automakers really don't want anyone looking at that. They claim proprietary interest in that data because if you look at it too carefully, it might be a discover that actually they should have designed the brakes a little better or, or, or whatever else. So, so the rest of us who might have an interest in in, in, in that data and society that arg arguably has an interest in making sure that we're using it to allocate uh, costs uh, fairly and efficiently are at this point out of luck. We haven't even gotten to autonomous vehicles and we're already at a point where there's a significant um, disadvantage uh, in, in open access to that, that kind of information. Yeah, but, but, but the complexity of the issue, I mean, this is a transitional problem you're describing. The complexity of the issue in automated driving when the human failure and all the related issues of fault don't exist anymore because the human is not driving but reading. I, I think that the it honest... Will, yeah. it, will, it will reduce you know, many of those thorny issues which we are now discovering, uh, discussing because it takes the driver as, you know, one of the main causes, was the guy drunk, was he driving right or not, it takes the driver out of the equation. Paul, Paul, so but I, I, think I, I think on this count, you know, I, I mean, I would say, you know, it will be easier. I'm happy to say you're, this is a first. You're more of a technological optimist than I because I actually yes. think, I, I, I really do think that if you talk to people who were, you know, who are working in robotics, who are working in, 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 in machine vision, what they will tell you is that we are certainly many years, maybe decades away from a point when there's really full autonomy. There'll be incremental increases towards it, but it may be okay, that we, no we remain in that never, never land, in that transitional wow. mode for the better part of our lives. Uh, uh, it's really not obvious that you, that you Get there. But it's a transitional problem. I mean, I think here, the li you know, the liability issue eventually at the end of the situation when everything is automated in driving, it will be easier. Yeah? Because you, you, you don't have the human, you know, the difficult human at the wheel anymore. So I think that's something where I would say yes in the, the transition and given the important economic interests of the car industry, you know, we have to invest brain power in this logic, logic, logic. 
and there's a competition element, you know, the industry wants to have these, uh, the rights of trial uh, on the streets and so on, and, you know, there are people dealing with it, <coughs> but I would say from a fundamental rights point of view and a democracy point of view, not the number one or the number two question. All right, so before we open it up to the audience, I just want to raise one more topic, and it, and, and it felt particularly important to me, given the, your point about the difference between government as hierarchy and government as service provider. What do you think is the right role for government in identity management? Is it government's role hierarchically to define who we are and to authenticate us everywhere? Or is that a service provision for which government is not subject to requirements of motivation? Should the, in the end, identity be the function of the state to determine? For these purposes, it is clear that the Chinese alternative is baked. And the Chinese alternative, baked as it is in China, is now the experiment of the Indians in Adhar and cashlessness multiplies all of this twice over by intervening that state authentication and identity management function to every transaction, no matter how big or how small. Are we ultimately going to want, in your judgment, for the state to be the, the manager of identity, or are we going to run shy of that? Well, I mean, what we have uh, is, of course, very different traditions. Even in Europe, you know, in the UK, you have no identity card. Uh, in many of our member states that you have an identity card, which you actually also have been for a long time also obliged to carry. Um, also the use of biometrics in, in passports and identity cards is a very thorny issue. But I would say uh, this, um, you know, there is no reason to go further in the direction of identity management. The state should not manage your identity. But it has provided in the past the basic ingredients for your ability to show others, you know, I am Paul Nimitz, you know, here's my passport. And I think this function uh, has to be maintained uh, in the digital. I don't think that there's a, a good reason to hand this over to private parties by law. You know, it may factually be that today people identify themselves voluntarily with Facebook and everybody in business and maybe even the state accepts it. Um, and at the same time, I would say, you know, one has to be very careful in going further. You know, for example, the discussion about the cashless society, uh, well, you know, that is a, a huge gain in efficiency maybe, but it's a loss in freedom and therefore, uh, you know, we have a lot of political resistance and I think for good reasons. People are worried about this. They want to be able to pay in cash and because cash payments is anonymous. And, you know, I would say there, you know, don't rush into this type of systems which only increase the potential for people management and, and surveillance of individuals. I mean, in the end, you know, we want a state which is controlled by the people and not a state in which the state controls the people. So any tool which we put in place which increases the control power over the state, you know, we have to be extremely critical and there must be severe limitations. So, you know, my view is also, let's say, in the whole law enforcement area and secret services, their capabilities have, are increasing simply because of progress of technology. And this increase of capabilities in these central areas of government powers with deep intrusions into individual rights has to be compensated by stricter oversight and stricter laws and limitations, which are pretty tough. And, you know, I would say one has to fight for this because if one doesn't do it, the progress of technology in the hands of the state will lead to a net loss of freedom. Uh, I, I mean, I'm very uncomfortable with the idea of the state controlling one's ability to assert, assert one's identity. Um, I think the good news is even, I, I, I won't speak to the situation in, in India because I think it's A, complex, and B, in flux, but um, if you really look at identity assertion, identity is essentially a statistical property now in any case where it's interesting. So how does MasterCard decide whether I'm Danny Weitzner? Not by checking a whole lot of documents, but by analyzing my behavior. And at any given moment, I'm either Danny or I'm not, um, depending on whether MasterCard believes it. And, and, that's, and I'm, I'm actually perfectly happy in a world in which 
people have actually different manifestations of their identity. It may be the same name, the same identifier, but I think from a from a, a, a civil liberties and, and uh, you know limited government perspective, that's a good result. Um, I think it's also a result that recognizes that in most cases, one's identity is a kind of a risk-based phenomenon. It's uh, you know again if if my identity for the purpose of signing a mortgage on a half a million dollar house is a very different proposition than my identity on Twitter. Um, uh, and well, I'm not saying which is more important, but you know they're different. Um, <laughs> uh, um, and, and so I, I think it's better that we have flexibility in society to to, to have these different kinds of identity assertions um, uh, function somewhat independently. Um, it is interesting to me that in the context of fake news and concern about uh, uh, disinformation online, um, I actually, as a sort of odd little data point, I had three different groups of students who were quite uh, savvy from a computer security perspective and quite uh, vociferous from a civil liberties perspective, all said, well, maybe we need the government to vouch for who's speaking online and who isn't. And, and that is, it's just, it's an alarming, it's anecdotal, but it's an alarming data point to me, simply because it seems like maybe we have run out of confidence in other sources of identity. But to me, the idea of the state controlling the ability to make political speech is horrifying. Um, and, uh, but, but maybe that's going to be our answer. I don't know. Well, we at least ought to understand the source of the alternate argument which is the point you made yourself, that in a, in a world of statistical uh, assessment of identity unsupported by state authentication, the incentive to collect as much behavior data as possible is maximized because right. you can't perform any yes. of the basic right. functions of commerce without right. spying the fuck out of everybody. But I'm not, unhappy, not, but I'm not unhappy about that. As a, as, ah. a, as, a, as a MasterCard holder, I want them to spy on me because I don't want to be responsible when someone else gets my card or uses my number. But you do, I, want, them, I, but you do want them to be responsible if the of course, of all that yes. behavior and collection there, gets right, out And of there control. I do want the protection of the state uh, uh, to make sure that, that that spying only happens in very limited uh, boundaries. Which, for which is we why eventually risk. the state gets around to cutting out the middleman, right. <laughs> whether it is student right. loans or identity. I, that's, that's right. That's and right. that's why right. the irony that's right. gets so deep, right? Yes. Because yes. those because those expectations are in conflict well, and somebody wants to sell you a technical no, solution. No, 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 but I, I still think both in the U.S. and Europe we do a reasonable job of, you know, looking to governmental functions that have some independence, whether it's the Federal Trade Commission, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, may it long live, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the data protection authorities, may they become better enforcers. Uh, uh, but but we, do, we do have these kind of governmental functions that are nevertheless, I think, independent enough that I, I, I'm okay with the FTC protecting me against MasterCard identity abuse, and I'm not that worried that the FBI is going to get its hands on what the FTC uses to protect me with. I, I, or, I mean, we always have to be careful about that, but I think it's reasonable to expect that we have almost this quasi-judicial enforcement function that is separate enough from other government functions that I, I think way, it's right, kind of the best Another way to we describe have. that is we use patchy regulation in the yeah. United States, yeah. vertical yeah. in over here, empty and, over and Europe, there. And Europe does and as well. And Europe, and Europe does as well. Well, with an ambition, maybe, for a more unified approach, which I think Paul no, is expressing. If we take it slow no, 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 enough, but we I don't could think get it right once. I don't think it's an ambition to make it a less independent approach. I mean, there's, right? I mean, I think, if anything, the ambition is to make it a more independent approach. Well, I mean, I think we have both, uh, but uh, uh, we, we, we have the horizontal regulation on privacy, and I'm convinced also for artificial intelligence we need some basic household rules of horizontal nature. But then, of course, also on data protection, you will have and you do have already now also specific rules in specific areas, uh, you know, and this will also be the case uh, in artificial intelligence. So, 
I think uh, the classic quarrel between uh, Europe and the United States has been do we need horizontal rules and my understanding was you guys wanted horizontal rules. You tried with President Obama twice the Baseline Privacy Act but it didn't work politically. So I think there was agreement we need hor some horizontal rules and I would think on the artificial intelligence would of course be good to agree um, on some you know, basic uh, horizontal rules but uh, that it's clear that... Um, but ours were only partially... Ours were horizontal in that they filled the gap, but they were not horizontal in that we continue co appropriately to rely on the health privacy laws that we have, the financial privacy laws that we have. So, so yeah, we have a gap that needs to be filled, um, but that doesn't mean that we're replacing the sectoral approach that we have to privacy that I think works well in the U.S., that is appropriate to the U.S. environment, with, a, with, a, with an omnibus approach, which I understand why it exists in Europe, but we don't, we don't, we don't live in that But But in, in this world. world of theoretically being able to connect all databases, it's very important to keep them separate and to have purpose limitations. That means if data is collected for a certain purpose, it cannot just be used for anything. So, you know, we have to also confront very self-confidently this theory of big data, which is well, you know, there must be a big data pod is in there and then everybody can use it. It sounds great and, you know, they get, you get these lessons about maximizing the learning from big data. It's all true. But if you do it, you completely lose freedom and control over the data. So our rules are just different. Our rules say, you know, if the data must be collected for a certain purpose and it can only be used for this purpose in principle. And it's true, then, the learning is a But we have reduced. those rules all over the place in health Good. privacy and financial privacy. Yeah. We have them all right. over okay. purpose limitations. Yeah. No, no, but I mean also in the discussion about the benefits of big data, we, uh, it, of course, democracy and rule of law has a cost. It will reduce the efficiency of big, big data learning if you say there's a purpose limitation, this data can only be used for this purpose. Yes? And those who dream of perfection in government, you know, starting with our Chinese friends and maybe also others in this world, also in Europe, we have this constantly, you know, the security guys, they want to see everything all the time. And, you know, there we have to fight and say, no, yeah, because that's the end of freedom. Yeah, I'm skeptical about both of you because I think what you really mean is we have very important use restrictions defeated entirely by meaningless consent. And this was the point about no, the No, we don't. No, we in Europe consent. cannot be, rely on no, consent I don't, I, ever. No, I, I don't think Never. we do. Um, I think we have plenty of use restrictions that are not defeated by, by consent. Not, not formally defeated by consent, but practically defeated by consent. That's how 87 million people got dragged into a political scam, because their friends filled out a psychographic agreed, questionnaire. Agreed. Okay, that's, that's, that's what we mean when, that's and, what and, we mean and, and, when but, Facebook but, but, decided but, but, to but, move but, all but, terms of yes. service for non-European parties out of Ireland But the last problem month, there, but right? Evan, the problem yeah. there, I would suggest, is very clearly a lack of enforcement both in the U.S. and in Europe. When all of those events were happening in, uh, as to Cambridge Analytica, when Facebook designed the APIs that made the, the collection of all these people's data possible in 2011, uh, uh, number one, the FTC was investigating uh, Facebook and could have stopped those practices, and number two, Europe had on the books through the, the implementations of the previous data protection law enormous amount of authority that should have been used to protect us all and neither government did it because neither government was confident enough in its enforcement ability. So, so we really should be careful about thinking just more law is going to help us. What I think will help us is, 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 is more vigorous enforcement, more eyes and, 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 and effective uh, pressure. Yeah, the story in America is not over yet, and neither is it in Europe. So I mean, we'll yeah, but, see. but what five years went by and no one did anything. Yeah, yeah because because eighty-seven million people law, but, but, you know. But, but 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 isn't the FTC now investigating with a view of potentially on the basis of the consent decree, uh, you know, imposing a pretty large fine, and the fine uh, of course is of course. possible also in Europe. I mean, after all. Uh, but all I'm saying is that we didn't need the GDPR to go after those no, practices. No, that's true. We didn't need any changes in U.S. privacy yes. law to go after that. No, practices. we needed what Paul described at the beginning, which is engineered in 
rules about, other, about APIs in the private market. And the idea that the FTC is going to get technically soft, technically tough enough and well-funded and well-populated yeah. enough to determine whether the APIs being used by pro platform companies in the private market design in adequate respect for human dignity they would is not they would design be it in. Easy. Facebook would design those controls in if they knew there was going to be cost at the back end for failing to have them, for, for, for allowing well, the data to get out. Maybe it's very that's, simple. Maybe it's really well right. understood how to do it. And, and I mean, they Facebook took an entirely calculated risk about choosing to open up those APIs. Um, and uh, yeah, again, and, 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 again and, and, I, to, to me, it all comes down to the perception of these companies about what kind of enforcement risk they are under. Um, it's not about what is written yeah. Either in their privacy policies or in uh, anyone's yeah. that, Which That's is why, why which is why policy is yeah. such a yeah. trick. Because if they have Larry Summers one step from the over office and he's a friend, that's going to have an effect on their willingness to take certain risks. On the other hand, if we tried to treat Facebook as an entity which doesn't know that it has political leverage with governments around the world and therefore can be a little risk-taking about things, yep. we wouldn't be understanding the power that they now exercise. So there's the second order consequence of effect on political process, which policy wonks ought really to be concerned about. Okay, we need to get other people into this because now we're almost agreeing, which is the proper time <laughs> to get other people into it. Please just wait for a microphone to be delivered to you when you raise your hand so that we can keep this all on the tape. Matt, why don't you make the pick here? Ooh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, my name's, hi. Hi. I'm Rachel. Um, I, I don't work in this field at all, but I'm, you know, the consummate end user. And just to, t I have two questions. One is um, kind of following up on all the talk about Facebook right now. I, I was at um, the the hearings uh, a couple weeks ago in Washington with Mark Zuckerberg, and um, just as a, you know, concerned citizen. But I kept thinking, why? You know, I, I just, okay, first, I found out that they have a 200, like the rest of the world, a 200-person um, team dedicated to counterterrorism at Facebook. And I just, and that, that actually, you know, really struck me as, isn't this the government's role or job? Why, why, did, why does Facebook, a technology company, I mean, just in the most simple policy concept, why are they taking on the onus of, surveillance and counter surveillance so that that's one question um, you know instead of make, you know their their main job of connecting the world which they do very well and, and which does make them powerful uh, and then my second question is is related to autonomous autonomous vehicles and you, you did mention Tesla and you mentioned the Tesla in in the UK and the the accident there um, but what you know? What about some of the other big companies that are uh, not uh, automakers? Who are you know? It's kind of like the Facebook uh, doing counterterrorism thing for me in my simple mind. Why? Why is there? Uh, you know? You know? Google is now creating aut and testing autonomous vehicles. Uber um, <coughs> has has been doing the same. So you know, what does that landscape look like for? Um, for the future and the future of the auto industry, and how you know um, when the big tech now, the big tech is is working on these very same issues. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'll say one thing about uh, Facebook and counterterrorism, and and I think this really. So first of all, my my sense is that most of what those two hundred people are doing, whatever the number is, is they're responding to. Um, uh, either internally generated takedown request, that is this person, this user has posted something that looks like something that's threatening, or responding to those uh, um, requests that come from outside of Facebook. Um, um, I think that the, the reason, well, I, I, don't, I don't know that I want to, I, I don't know how to characterize the reason that they're doing it, but um, I, I think why they're in the position of doing that is because of this very unusual challenge of scale. Um, it's a platform of two billion people, as you know, um, um, and 
So there's going to be unusual behavior in <laughs> amongst that many people. And we've decided for a whole bunch of reasons that the first line of response is the Facebooks and the Googles and the other platforms. So um, whether it's on questions like um, uh, uh, the, uh, the right to be forgotten, uh, which is a right that Europe has now recognized, um, the European legal system has said to the platforms, if someone claims a right to be forgotten, you have to go figure out um, uh, whether uh, they in fact have that right and then in, a, in the case of a specific information and, and take the information down. We've done the same thing with uh, copyright uh, enforcement. We've said to um, YouTube and Facebook and anyone else who's in the position of hosting third party video or audio or anything that's potentially copyright infringing that, that they're kind of the first line of defense in responding to, to those sort of requests. And it's as a very practical matter, it is simply because there's no way governments could even begin to have enough people to do this. I guess they could, but we would end up talking about social welfare. We'd end up spending money uh, where it I think people would probably. It would be hard to reduce taxes yeah, right, on the rich right. very much. Right. And so, so um, we, we, but, but it goes back to the history of these platforms where specifically when the U.S. Congress said in 1996 that um, the platform's liability for third-party content would be limited. One of the reasons the U.S. Congress said that is because the Congress actually wanted the platforms to self-police. The Congress actually wanted Facebook to say, okay, we're going to create a family-friendly environment or we're going to create an environment free of speech that various people may find offensive. Um, now, when Congress did that, there were um, 6,000 plus internet service providers and hundreds and hundreds of web hosts and other kinds of platforms. What I think is very complicated now is that we have a much smaller number of platforms and the power that, that the, those platforms are exercising over content in some cases looks a whole lot more, as you suggest, like state power than it does uh, 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 like private power. So there was a rationale behind that, which was that we actually didn't want government in the position of making those kinds of choices about content on free expression grounds. We wanted different platforms to have different personalities, if you will. Um, but now that there are so few of them, I think some of those decisions look different. Paul, did you want to speak on this? Well, I mean, you know, the banks have to make sure that there's no money laundering. They have a legal obligation to check from certain amounts, you know, when you come to the bank with $100,000 in cash, you know, they have to look a little bit, you know, what kind of guy you are. Uh, and in the same way, uh, uh, you know, um, the platforms in terrorism context or pedophilia, you know, or pictures of rape or, you know, uh, they have legal obligations. And, uh, you know, uh, that's what they have to comply with. The notice and takedown means, you know, if they get notice of uh, content which is illegal, they have to deal with it. And, you know, uh, uh, in America everybody understands money when it's about copyright because it's the music industry and the film industry and everybody obliges. But when it's about other public interests, people start talking about freedom of speech. Well, I'm sorry, no, I mean, in, in, we cannot have a world in which the freedom of speech means you can call on violence and say, you know, kill this guy, kill that guy, kill, and this woman journalist, you know, rape her because I, we don't like her contributions. And terrorism is the same thing. So Someone's going to have to tell the president. I think it's completely, is completely illegitimate, and I, I, I would say, you know, they have responsibilities because they are so powerful, they're so big, you know, and making profits and being a big owner of these, all these infrastructures and services also comes with responsibilities. And I would say, you know, we have to tighten the screw on the responsibilities because they're not doing enough. There's still, uh, you know, uh, are fora for incitement of violence and hatred, anti-Semitism, you know, hatred of Muslims uh, uh, and so on. And they've got to get their shop in order and they're competing with journalism and the press and they have to do it and they have to carry the costs and they undermine them by taking away all the advertisements. So all the money on advertisement it goes to Facebook and Google now. And the journalists force power in the state in democracy. You know, they, they, they don't exist anymore. They, they, they have to find the money on the street somewhere. 
And at the same time, we want to continue saying, yeah, but Google and Facebook, you know, their freedom is so important, you know, and we don't want them to do this and that. What the press has to do with which they compete for attention and for money. So let There's me just something say that fundamentally wrong in this discourse about don't touch the platforms. The platforms today are not anymore just passive telecommunications like providers of technology. They are huge editors, they regroup the content, they are basically, you know, um, enterprises to attract, uh, to, to produce in an um, advertising friendly environment, yes? And they have also the capability to do this. You know, I'm sorry, big profits also oblige you to do what is necessary in the public interest. So let me just so say, I, I have think no, it's... You know, I mean, no, because I'm in America, I have to get my rent out. I have no, <laughs> I have no problem We're with We're very this. glad to provide the platform uh, for that. I and I, 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 I would say, you know, on this platform liability privilege from 1996, and Europe has copied it at the time, we have to start thinking about it, whether that is still justified today. Because these guys are not anymore passive platforms. They are active shapers of content. And with active shaping of content, taking the money away from press, in addition, come responsibilities. Can I have a counter rant? Yes, please. <laughs> just, 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 I, I, just very quickly. Well, who needs an audience? Just, just, just very quickly, because I... I think I actually agree with Paul that that the the uh, capabilities and behaviors of the platforms are much expanded, obviously, from what they were in '96. So, uh, so to me, uh, the role of platforms as advertisers, as an example, as 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 services that profile users target ads, to me, that is outside the scope of what should be protected by this by this Section 230. However, Exactly because the platforms are so powerful and because we depend on them so much, I still think we have to be extra careful that there is a lot of plain old ordinary speech that happens on these platforms. Yes. And, 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 you know, we had debates, as you know, in U.S. law about speech in malls and other kinds of private places and that didn't really get resolved, I think, in a very satisfactory way ever. But, um, but, but, uh, but I think that for all the reasons Paul is saying about the power of the platforms and the fact that we depend on them as individuals, um, we also have to make sure, we have to be very careful about the kind of pressure that governments put on these platforms. Obviously, there's, you know, sort of agreement about pedophilia. Um, you get into other kinds of speech and it gets more complicated. Yeah. And so I think, I think it's, a, it's a delicate balance. And to me, the most important thing is that we should have more transparency, we should have adequate transparency into understanding what those decisions look like. Because we have to understand if either governments are putting too much pressure on the platforms or the platforms are exercising authority they ought not to be uh, 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 able to exercise. So I've got exactly two cents to contribute to that, which is to say that Danny is right, that of those 200 people, let us say 190, are busy responding to takedown requests and compliance activity. The other 10 are spies. The most important story we cannot write yet because we don't have the data concerns the real-time merger between the platform companies and the intelligence services. The intelligence services in China with respect to the Chinese companies, well, we all have a certain amount of understanding. And as usual in the world since 2001, it's actually more obscure what happens in the United States. Those of us who walk this beat have a bunch of information we can't reliably share publicly because we have no way to verify it. But you should understand that from the point of view of those of us who do this work professionally, what is going on is a merger between intelligence services and the platform companies seeking real-time connections between the two forms of entities. And your idea that what is happening is that the private world is being conscripted to intelligence activity is partly right, and partly what is happening is that CIA officers are working at Google and Facebook. And that we can say with confidence, even though we're not in a position to point at Jimmy and Sally and Susie over there, we know that it is going on. 
we, we see it in our sources inside the companies, which means that one of the things you need to understand is the depth of the obscurity of the process you're calling attention to. So that was the answer to half of one question. Yeah, I'm sorry to say it isn't going very fast. Let's do better. Matt, can you? No, yes, thank you. That's fine. Thank you. Um, thanks for your contributions. I'd like to make one remark and then a question, mostly for Mr. Nimitz, but for the panel. Um, so it seems like what's on the table is this discussion of statistics in the large and data collection in the large. And uh, another element I'd like to bring into it is the actual infrastructure that's required to like make these reasoning and to collect the data itself. And that bottoms out with things, you know, devices like the phone that I have in my pocket, the router that I bought that was, you know, unable to accept updates, firmware updates from the vendor, or did accept firmware updates or something like this. Um, so I'd also just like to make people consider or bring that materiality of the regulatory aspect. There are actually, you know, devices just like um, cordless telephones or plugs that have fuses in them that we can regulate and have regulated in the past. Um, the other question harkens back to something that Mr. Nemitz talked about at the very, very beginning, which is when he was explaining the rationale for the Commission's interest in like this idea that we have to preempt the harms or the dangers of this particular technology, just like atomic energy and just like um, environmental regulation. Is that correct? Like, the, like the, a doctrine of, of anticipation that justifies intervening in situations where the demos can't or doesn't understand or can't foresee the harms just yet. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that, about what makes uh, let's say big data and artificial intelligence, or more generally statistics, one of these areas in which the Commission is obligated to intervene. Is it because it's too difficult to explain, and if so, should we should we not try, or is it because the harms are unforeseeable, or is it some combination of both? So, like, what are the specific aspects of this problem domain that mean that there's a necessity for the Commission to intervene? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, just to start with a misunderstanding, we are doing thinking work. But the intervention in terms of making binding law will come from the legislator. So, uh, but I would say, you know, it's our duty to scope the issue and to learn and understand and, you know, come to an analysis what will be the impact of these technologies. technologies. So that is an essential part of precaution that you equip yourself, that you invest in finding out what are the capabilities of these uh, technologies and what can they lead to. And then you have to make a judgment. Uh, the Commission is only a body of initiative. You know, we regulate nothing. We make the proposal then to the legislator, and then we have to convince them. And often it takes very long time to convince the legislator because if, if the risk is invisible, you know, uh, people are saying, "Yeah, but we don't need legislation. Everything is fine. Let them continue innovating." So uh, that's what uh, is the mechanism which you know see in climate change and environmental policy. It always takes ages and in smoking and, you know, so um, the, the learning is often by catastrophe. The legislator then acts after a catastrophe. And what I'm saying is, and I'll, I'll give you now a precise answer on the risks of AI, if technology is moving fast, maybe from time to time, if the risks are high on the horizon, we have to move fast. Now, why are the risks of um, AI potentially high? And one problem is that we don't actually know very well how these capabilities are developing behind closed walls of big corporations who spend billions of dollars on it, have thousands of people. You know, it's, you know they give the tens of flow to the public, but what's actually the capability? You know, they are very different information. If you go to the MIT, there are some people who say, oh, you know, it's going to take 20, 30 years until they can do this and this. And the others say, who, which say, within five, that's the quote I remember, within five to 10 years, AI will win all games. And when I asked, what does it mean to win all games? The answer was stock markets and elections. Right. So if people tell me, as a policy developer, in 10 years, AI programs win will the, win will the elections, well, then we start working on the question, how can we maintain democracy? And, you know, that needs to be looked at. Because, uh, uh, you know, the, the, I would say this is something where precaution is justified. You cannot just let it go down the drain because it may be irreversible. In fact, you know, the modern technologies today in, in the hands of dictators, once they're in place, make return to democracy increasingly difficult. I'm ready for all the autonomous systems to get together and elect themselves to whatever in the <laughs> world the yeah. political offices are. Yes, yes. When, when we see that, then, then, I, then we really will have something. 
Yeah, hi. Uh, so we talked about these platforms, right, why they are limited platforms. So my question is why that's happening in Internet itself, right? So that has to come from the policy side. So we talked about data lakes coming in, but I feel what's missing is data mobility itself. So we don't have open APIs. So there is no Facebook A or Facebook B, right? So issue is once we have this Cambridge Analytica thing issue, there is no option B for us. So what are your uh, ideas in terms of policy and so how government can help us in creating open APIs itself uh, and helping the consumers have a choice as well? Um, so I, I would say that I, I find this question of data portability very complex and maddening. Um, a lot of people talk about the importance of being able to move your Facebook profile around, to move your social network around. I frankly don't understand what in the world that means without completely uh, obliterating any sense of privacy of everyone else in my social network. So I think that it is, so, so, so I think that's an example of a policy direction that I am frankly a little bit underwhelmed by, to be blunt, um, and I know it's a right in the, in the, in the, the GDPR, but I don't understand what good it really is um, uh, unless we, yeah. Um, I, I do think on the other hand, we have um, clearly movement across different platforms. Um, uh, uh, you know, I think if you talk to people at Facebook, they will tell you they are quite worried by the fact that um, uh, they have fewer and fewer people under 18 uh, spending any time at all on Facebook because they spend time on Snapchat or, or other, other sorts of things. And, um, and to me what that says is there certainly is an important role in, 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 in competition policy to make sure that, that, kind of, that, that, that we don't end up with platforms in such dominant positions that it's hard to move. But I think that that is a it's a market phenomenon, not really so much a technical phenomenon. Um, I do think there's very interesting work happening with entirely different architectures of social networks. Uh, Evan's involved in the Freedom Box uh, work. My colleague up at MIT, Tim Berners-Lee, has a, a, an architecture called Solid, uh, which is a way of enabling people to store data kind of wherever they want to store it and have applications that work on top of it, social applications that are separate from the storage of the data. Um, and I think, uh, you know, my hope is that those kinds of, of applications will, will develop so that we have um, the ability to exist in, in less centralized uh, uh, social media. Um, I do think they all pose enormous, enormous privacy challenges. I think the more we decentralize these systems, the harder it will be to hold them accountable to any set of rules uh, at all. I think there are some technical approaches there, but um, uh, I think it's a complicated problem. That, that, was the, that was the crucial exchange, I think, right now for the issue you're talking about. Danny and Sir Tim and I have all wanted to re-decentralize the web for a very long time. Danny just said, yeah, but accountability is really my, my bottom card. And re-decentralization is not pro-accountability, and so I'm beginning to get dubious. I'm not where he is about that, because as prior exchanges have suggested, I'm not sure that I think accountability is all he cracks it up to be. But if he and Hal Abelson had been right about how to run data accountability at the end of the 20th century, I would now agree with him would have worked. It didn't work because it didn't have uptake then when it needed to. So now I'm still in radical re-decentralization mode. Insert Freedom Box advertisement mm -hmm. here. But let's just say that there are public policy steps you could take. FCC could tell telecommunications service providers no banning servers from the endpoints of your retail customers. We could stop discriminating in favor of everybody's a client and takes what she gets and begin to use the telecommunications network in a way which was more populist in character. The consequence of which would be that more data would be in tiny little silos of people who really are friends with one another. It is true that it would be harder to hold that data accountable, but it would be much harder to aggregate yeah. it and turn it into behavior collection networks for advertising companies. 
companies, right? Then we do have the question, how should the advertising market be organized? Paul said, remember, there used to be media, they took advertisements, they had advertising respectability rules, they had acceptability departments, they didn't let people put fraudulent advertising in their newspapers. They were regulated, but nobody said that violated the First Amendment because everybody thought that false advertising was not protected speech. That, that, that suggests that we do have steps to take in the large-scale regulation of the advertising market that would change underlying incentive structures against data centralization and in favor of at least some form of agnostic or neutral attitude about whether you store it away or you store it at home. There are public policy steps, in other words, that could be taken, but the Zuckerberg television show was not a step in that direction. And that's the problem, right? That, that this layer that you want to get to, where we have to come to a conclusion about accountability as against decentralization as a way of controlling out of control behavior protection can't complete. Because although we can talk about it here, the policymakers are not actually listening to us because the political conversation has been tilted in its usual sensational fashion. But uh, if I may, um, uh, on portability, I mean, of course, I understand your questions on what po does portability mean in a social network, but by God, you know, uh, the internet is not only social networks. I mean, we have, you know, loyalty bo programs, bank accounts, playlists, you know, there are many areas where portability absolutely makes mm -hmm. sense, raises no privacy issue, is good for competition and innovation, and we have to enforce it radically. You know, I mean, when we negotiated that article, which is not a data protection article, it's really a market provision, there was the classic resistance of incumbents, which we had when we imposed by law uh, portability of mobile telephone numbers and portability of bank accounts. You know, huge resistance each time. You know, we will go bankrupt and socialism and I don't know, you know, all the devils of the world is against portability. Um, but now we have it in law and it will be enforced. And I think we have to, you know, complain and put the pressure on and um, on this decentralization I would say well the GDPR actually gives a big uh, incentive to decentralization in the sense that if you can you want to not hold in a central depository all this personal data so I mean I see there are some interesting trends you know if Apple says well you know we better keep it all on the phone you know we build an AI chip we don't want the data to come to us you know, rather leave it in the hand of the individual who produces the data. For me, you know, that's interesting and it could be going in the right direction. I'm, I'm in favor of a re-decentralization of the net for empowerment reasons, it, uh, uh, for re reducing the centralized power uh, of these corporations, and also for data protection, because if the data stays with the individuals, you know, the likelihood is that uh, the abuse will be much less. There will be some problems, of, uh, but, uh, but they will be less big than, than the problems which we have now with all the personal data in the depositories of Google, Facebook, and Salesforce. Well, the behavioral experiment of whether the GDPR is going to make them want to keep less data is now ongoing. We shall see <laughs> what happens, that's for sure. Donna? Can, yeah. Thanks. Uh, I, I actually had a question for Mr. Weitzner. Uh, so as someone who is on this panel and as someone who worked for the Obama administration, I, I was curious to know what your sort of look back on the way the Obama administration used social network data uh, in, in the run-up to the 2008 campaign. I know it used some Facebook data um, and I just was sort of curious to hear your, your retrospective on that. Uh, so, so I didn't... Uh, have a huge amount to do with that. Um, uh, I would say that th there was a kind of an interesting comparison uh, between the the main Obama campaign app on Facebook in 2012, between what how that worked, um, which did have access to a very large amount of personal data, and how the um, the Cambridge Analytica analytic function worked. So the Obama app uh, was an app that enabled, that would suggest to the individual which of your friends you might want to communicate to about the campaign. Uh, but the, the, the communication was from the individual to 
whomever, whoever in your friend network. Um, the Cambridge Analytica uh, approach was obviously different. That was about placing ads or, or messages or other kinds of things um, based on uh, a kind of a centrally developed uh, uh, profile. So interestingly, same universe of data when you look at it um, from above, but the use was, was quite different and you know, I have my preferences for which one I think was more respectful and consistent with democratic process. I mean, there's no question that, you know, politics is a very, uh, it's, a, it's a personally intrusive activity. It, you know, you're trying to get in front of people and tell them what you think and what they should think. So it's not a leave me alone kind of environment. <laughs> and, and um, but I think it is an environment where we, where, where I think you certainly have to expect that you know who's talking to you, or at least you know whether a machine or a, a person is, is, is talking to you. And my guess is we're going to come back to some of the anonymous political speech questions that were raised in McIntyre a long time ago, um, and probably think about some of those again in, in this context. After the last Indian general election, my law partner, Mishy Chaudhary, mm -hmm. and I were talking to someone who had worked in the BJP IT cell on the Modi campaign. And he said, well, we've learned that there's really no way to get to a voter through SMS with an argument to the conscious mind. But we have learned that there is no limit to what you can do by getting to a voter through SMS in the unconscious mind. I think the distinction that Danny was making between using the data for organizing purposes under human control on the one hand and reaping data for psychographic models that you keep private on the other hand is close to the correct distinction. The most important distinction is between the conscious and the unconscious in politics. And what is most important in my judgment about the machine's intervention in politics around the world is that it is driving political discourse to interaction with the unconscious mind which is destructive of democracy in a different and fundamentally, to my mind, more complete way. We are driving a bunch of technology against the idea that democracy is about making choices as opposed to responding to feelings. And the button pushing is now primarily going on at the unconscious level because professionals around the world have realized that that's the level where they can be effective. Dinah, I'm sorry to keep you from asking your question. Sorry, I had about eight questions in mind, but I'll restrict myself to just a few. Um, I, I work for human rights groups, so I'm interested in this issue from the perspective of the right to a remedy for a violation. How does the individual achieve a remedy? Um, which may not always be through a cause of action. It may be through public policy, as you've noted. Um, I wanted to, in that context, uh, ask about a few different issues. One of them is we've talked about the problems of data aggregation. So um, while certainly creating smaller silos might be helpful, it seems to me it doesn't entirely answer the problem of aggregation as a circumvention of ways we might regulate, for example, against flat out discriminatory uh, profiling or something like that, because you can get to discrimination easily through aggregation. Um, we haven't also talked about the data sets as biased. We've talked about the um, need to be able to access data and the restrictions of having private pools of data, but we haven't talked about how those private pools um, embed discrimination and uh, uh, all the ills of our world of perception. So I, in, that, in that context, I ask, are there solutions, for example, involving data auditing, whether by individuals or litigants or a profession of auditors, because this problem of uh, uh, review of data and the, who owns the data is very complex. And finally, when I talk to um, 
American engineers who genuinely care about human rights, they always bring up, but we're going to fall behind China. I mean, everybody brings this up constantly. So in terms of solutions, should there be um, market barriers, quality controls, transfer regimes? What do you think the prospect is for regional or international standards on uh, essentially AI acceptability or AI technology transfers and uses? Um, and I worry about this a lot because, of course, it's, you know, it's a issue both in private application and defense application. Uh, so those are three enormous issues that we haven't talked about, and feel free to ignore any of them because I know it's late. Yes. Okay, uh, so first of all, you know, uh, at least in Europe and in particular in the country which I know best, which is Germany, we've been through a number of China crazes, you know, oh God, China is going to take over all the machine building and it's going to take over the car industry. So, you know, there are interests which drive these crazes and they, you know, these are classically people who say, if you don't do this and this and this, then our industry will go down the drain. Ah, you know, not very impressed. Look needs a very hard look. In any case, all these technologies they develop have, if uh, according to European law, they have to comply with our rules. So, for example, if they have no privacy protections in the collection, GDPR, they can't provide the service in Europe. Finished. It's, it's as easy as that. And, you know, if they violate their own population, you know, it's terrible and it's a human rights issue uh, on the global level, but they can't use these technologies in, uh, in, in, in Europe. And if they want to sell there and make money, they will have to adapt and learn. And by the way, I mean, I'm convinced if the Chinese get richer, if the middle class is moving up, they will seek also these protections and these rights because it's part of the lifestyle of you know, richer people that they don't want to be controlled all the time by government and a total nanny state. So how does this <coughs> enforcement work? Well, my conviction is it cannot be left to individual complaints only because the individuals often don't know what's happening with the data. So you need ex officio investigations. That's why we have these data protection authorities. Their job is to go in and do the checking and do the audits. Of course, as an individual under our law, you can ask, what do you have about me? And you can require full transparency so uh, and i think you know that's going to become thorny you know facebook today we i i, I saw jan lacoon the chief ai engineer of facebook says we make 200 trillion predictions a day all right so all these predictions are personal data because they predict how you 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 will behave it's a thousand predictions on each of you well you know i want to know how facebook applies our rules to these predictions, and I want to see all predictions which they make on me, because I have that right under GDPR. So, you know, the answer is, we must use our rights, we must make the DPRs do their job, that's why under our regulation you can force a DPA to act, that's the problem with the FTC, nobody can really force them to act, you know, you have to deal with that in domestic law, um, you know, nobody will help you there, and in parallel, of course, you can bring damage cases. Mm, I'm you know, you have the right under, under the GDPR now. I don't think that's going to be very effective because a huge cost of litigation and difficult to show economic damage off. So the core element of our system is that these DPAs, data protection authorities, which have constitutional law <coughs> position, in primary law they're independent, they have to be staffed with hard-nosed people. You know, until now it's a lot of talky, talky shop and we love this conference and that, that conference. Well, in the future, you know, pub, put in a public prosecutor who already has done a good case, a number of good cases, or put in an auditor, you know, this is going to be very, very important. And I hope, and it's, I think it's possible, there will be some positive competition between the member states, which authority has the big, juicy cases and imposes the big fines. And these fines, you know, up to 4% of world turnover, is the fine under the GDPR the only reason why in America now so many companies invest in this is this fine. This is the big thing, plus of course now the experience with Facebook stock market. Fifty billion dollar stock market value loss in after Cambridge Analytics for Facebook, that's also quite hefty. So um, I would agree, you know, we need uh, uh, the incentives they are 
in our law, they are quite good, but they have to be realized now through tough enforcement. And this means also that NGOs, for example, can force a DPA to act. I have founded with Max Schrems in Vienna an NGO which is called None of Your Business. And this NGO will do strategic litigation on data protection against companies, but also against DPAs who are not doing their job. Please all join it. It's also good for Americans that this happens in Europe, because if you have a global business model, as we see with Facebook now, they try to differentiate, but it costs them the differentiation. Ideally, they want to have one business model. So, you know, if our rules are working well, Americans will also benefit. So, you know, help us to uh, strengthen the NGO world in, uh, in Europe so that the strategic litigation also has an impact. Um, Dinah, could I, I just want to focus on the audit question because I really like that. And I, I, I think it's in some ways the heart of the matter in how we're going to, over the long run, get to a more sensible set of policies. And, and I, wh what I think is interesting about it is um, it hopefully can inform a broad social and policy discussion about just what it is that we think is reasonable and not in what standards do we actually expect. I mean, I think there'll be, there'll be uses of data that are just outright either inaccurate or bad. And everyone will say, well, forget those. They're, they're, they're just, they're wrong. Um, but then I think there's going to be a lot of really hard problems. Uh, uh, so if you followed the, um, you know, the, the, the research on recidivism prediction that, that Julia Angwin kicked off, um, when you start looking at that, uh, you know, you then have um, people who are much smarter about math than I, John Kleinberg, came in and said, well, there's this sort of, he actually proved that you kind of can't have fairness both ways. That you can't, when, you, when you're trying to predict uh, um, amongst people who are, come from different populations with different crime uh, histories, um, that you can't have fairness in every dimension. You can have fairness uh, uh, as to uh, uh, your position in your subpopulation, or you can have fairness as to the whole society, but then you have less accuracy, and and that's a that's just a hard problem. You know, I don't know that there's an obvious answer, and the only way we're going to get to a answer is by having um, uh, data out there that, that 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 exposes that and has has us all debated. And I think that's going to recur in health, and it's going to recur in finance, and all kinds of all kinds of things. Um, what I think is, and it is a little bit like the insurance debate where because we, you know, because we had the big Obamacare debate, it got everyone to start thinking correctly and not correctly from first principles about insurance. We're going to have to start thinking from first principles about fairness, um, right? And the, I think the only way to do that is going to be based on open audits, which are going to be, in my mind, have to be about the collective effect of these different analytic processes, not the individual effect. That, you know, that, that, that's a, a kind of an established data protection right that you can say, how did it affect me? But I think the, the question that's really hard is how does it affect us as a society and what, what are the balances that we're willing to live with? Where are there, you know, fundamental rights, um, um, you know, no-go lines, and then where are there sort of more, more, more nuanced things? So I, I think it's a great question. I think, you know, again, just not to... Um, overly to Julia Angwin's horn, but I think she does great work. And one of the things that she's done is she said, journalists have to get much better at working with data. Well, I think probably, you know, human rights lawyers are probably, as you know, and as I know you guys are doing, are going to have to get much better at working with data uh, because it's the it's going to be the terms on which we have these debates, not the doctrine as much as the sort of empirical um, underpinnings of what's actually happening in different cases. So I think it's a fantastic question. On the discriminatory data sets question, I think what we're going to wind up with, we're going to need legislation. The law won't do it without it. We're going to wind up with the equivalent of Title VII public accommodations law. What it's going to say is that collections of information, behavioral data about people are the equivalent of public accommodations. And the 
decision making that results from them is subject to both disparate treatment and disparate impact kinds of reviews. Now how that law is going to develop is going to depend very much on how the legislation that roots it all happens and we're not even 10 years from that legislation yet. We need several Democratic Congresses in a row, or we need Lyndon Johnson to arrive back from the grave. But, 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 the, but the crucial problem <coughs> will be that the equivalent of conciliation will be auditing. And the, and the problem will be the relation between this self-regulatory inspection regime lightly overseen by the equivalence of something between EEOC and data protection authorities on the one hand, yeah. and the role of the courts in systematically pursuing the Duke powers of the future, right, which is, yeah. of course, the same people we keep talking about. So a great example of this is, you. I can't remember if Human Rights Watch was signatory of this letter from a number of civil rights organizations about face recognition, police use of face recognition technology. Um, so it ends up in, in, in large part because of work of a graduate student of, of ours in the media lab at MIT um, um, has shown that, you know, there's radically different uh, accuracy levels uh, depending on the race of the person in the facial recognition system. And it actually it goes all the way back to the fact that, A, the training sets are, are not represented, but even worse than that, actually photography doesn't work very well for people who are not white. Um, and so, so you have kind of all the way back to the beginning this kind of problem uh, about, about inaccuracy and, and inability to detect, to recognize people correctly, which, you know, has this whole long tail effect. And so, um, you know, that's just, it's just one case. We're going to have to look and say, okay, well, what is that, does that mean that technology is usable at all? Are there, are there mitigations in, you know, to deal with the kind of systematic uh, um, bias or what do you do? Which is going to turn out to be a lot like occupational testing and access yeah. to public employment yeah, right. and other sorts of situations for which we have at least operable models. What were right? the red line testers called, people who went into job, and, and all job of this, candidates? And, and, and all yeah. of this hinges upon the particular behavior of the Fair Housing Act or of Title VII or of a statutory scheme which presents underneath some quasi-administrative justice system which is supposed to handle most of it leaving, one hopes, the courts for some kinds of class action kind of activity that say, well, you know, if you're building an advertising platform which allows people to buy ads for folks who hate Jews and don't want to rent apartments to them, then that should be low-hanging fruit. We should be able to collect that first. And we should be able to use that as the basis for the legislative activity that has to follow in, in the same way that we saw it happen between 1954 and 1964 in the United States. But there has to be, at the end, a willingness on the part of Congress to do that work. And that's a political rather than a policy question, and we're nowhere close. All right, well, I want to thank you all for staying 20 minutes extra um, it was so wonderful that you came. Thank uh, my guests, uh, please, for me, because they deserve it. Enjoy the lovely weather.